and cracker jacks I don't care if I ever get back Let me root, root, root for the home team If they don't win it's a shame For it's one, two, three strikes you're out at the old ball game Welcome everyone to the virtual Las Vegas Jewish Film Festival. This is our fifth film and webinar over the past few months, and we are thrilled to have you back, or if it's your first time, thank you for joining us for the very first time. My name is Neil Popish. I am the program director with the Jewish Community Center, a division of Jewish Nevada, Nevada's Jewish Federation. I'd like to welcome you and I want to thank Joshua Abbey and the Las Vegas Jewish Film Festival for their wonderful partnership we formed over these past few months and years. Special thanks to the Robinson and Frankoff families for their sponsorship and dedication to Jewish films. We hope that you've enjoyed the series of films and webinars that, that follows. If you wish to be a sponsor of the virtual Las Vegas Jewish Film Festival, you can do so by visiting our donation page and it will be listed a link in the chat area of the webinar. I do want to make sure that the webinar is being recorded and it will be available to watch starting tomorrow on the Jewish Nevada YouTube page in case you'd like to see it again or share it with friends. The question and answer period with our panelists are, is finished. I will then ask questions from our participants. Uh, if you have a question from, uh, for any of our panelists, please feel free to ask in the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. Print, just type in your question and we will ask as many questions as the time allotted. allotted. Uh, I'd like to make one quick plug. The JCC in partnership with Jewish Nevada Holocaust Education Task Force has created a special book club open to all. It is called Women in the Holocaust, a virtual book club. The deadline to register to receive all the three, all three books and swag is this evening tonight at 8 p.m. Afterwards, you can still join and be a part of our webinars. We also will provide that link in the chat. We are honored to welcome award-winning filmmaker Aviva Kempner who is a producer and director and writer and has been making independent films since 1979. She is the founder and executive director of the Siesla Foundation, a nonprofit organization that produces documentaries that investigate non-stereotypical images of Jews in history and celebrates the untold stories of Jewish heroes through insightful and revealing storytelling, interviews with key figures and wide distribution, Kempner's films assure worthy individuals their rightful place in history. Kempner has also collaborated on films consulting on a documentary about Shimon Peres, the former Israeli president, and writing narration for Promises to Keep, the Academy Award nominated documentary on the homeless. She is a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. She is a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, the DCC Mayor's Art Award, the WIFV Women of Vision Award, 
and a Media Arts Award from National Foundation for Jewish she is the founder of the Washington Jewish Film Festival in Washington, D.C., where she resides. In addition to making films, Aviva Kempner is an activist for D.C. voting rights and continues to lecture about cinema and write film criticism. Also joining us is the Las Vegas Jewish Film Festival director, Joshua Abbey. Before I hand it over to Josh, I just wanted to say, as Mo asked on his deathbed, how did the Mets do? <laughs> Josh, thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Jewish Nevada. Thank you, JCC. Thank you, Lori and Richard and your families and everyone who has participated, including Danica behind the scenes doing the technical. Aviva, welcome to Las Vegas again. Three years ago, three years ago uh, Aviva, I believe it was three years ago, came to uh, speak in conjunction with the screening of her amazing film, Rosenwald which has never been more relevant about the famous philanthropist who built hundreds of schools. 5,000. Thousands, excuse 5, me. 5,000. 5,000 schools, <laughs> primarily for underserved and African-American young people in the South, many of many of which are still standing today. And we may mention a little bit about that film because of its relevance to what is very topical at the moment uh, with Black Lives Matter and uh, all the demonstrations across the country. But here today we're, going to be talking about one of the most wonderful baseball documentaries I've ever seen. Um, Aviva, you have done such a remarkable job with this film. The amount of work, research, you know, finding those archival images, um, sampling the famous Hollywood uh, films that corresponded, the interviews that you, re you were able to source out. Just let's start off there. Tell us a little bit about the backstory of how you came to the, wanting to do this project and then what the challenges were in organizing, uh, creating it. Right. Uh, well, first of all, hi, Nevada. Um, it's great to talk to you all. I guess whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, whatever the line is. But especially um, honored to, to be with Josh tonight, who has to be probably the biggest mensch of a, as a person as well as a, festival head in this country. I remember you called me very early to say how I was doing, and here it is months later. Um, you know, it's really interesting in terms of doing this film. First of all, I always tease that it's the third film I've done about an unknown Jewish American hero with Berg in the title. There's something about, you know, there's Greenberg, there's Goldberg, and now we're just back down to basics in terms of Berg. Um, I have to tell you that it's someone down there in um, Phoenix that's the reason this film exists. And this, uh, his name is uh, William Levine, who's the executive producer. You would have see, just seen his name on the film. So this is how I usually introduce the film. So Bill and I are having dinner some years ago, uh, not so many years ago, and he says to me, you know, Aviva, he has this thing about Jewish heroes that are uh, sports heroes. So he says, Aviva, you should make a film about Sid Luckman, the Jewish football player. And I said, but you know what? I hate football. He said, oh, then he thinks a minute and he says, well, how about Barney Ross, the famous Jewish boxer? And I said, I hate boxing more. I'm, I'm not big into violent contact sports. You know, I'm a baseball fan. He says, no problem. How about Moberg? Well, as they said, uh, the third is the charm. So sure enough, I said, oh, Bill, I'd love to do the film. And that was the first time someone offered me the chance to make a film and pay for it all. Because uh, it took me actually 13 years to make Hank Greenberg. My first independent film alone as a director. I call it my Bath Mitzvah film. But in any event, so I go to make this film. And I remembered when I was making um, The Life and Times of Hank Greenberg that my cameraman, Jerry Feldman, he films my LA interviews, including a wonderful interview with Walter Matthau, which has to have been the funniest interview I ever made. Because, and also a little awkward. We have um, Walter on the set, and he, ha he brought with him, it was at my cousin Arthur Hiller's house, who um, 
made, you know, made among other films, Love Story. Um, so we're sitting there filming and he's got Lenny on the set. So Walter keeps on talking to Lenny and won't look at me. Well, when you're shooting an interview, the camera is right to the right of you. Jerry set it up. And, you know, I, I kept on saying, uh, Mr. Matthau, you have to look at me. So he's irritated that I'm given, you know, Walter Matthau instructions. So without a hesitation, he takes his finger almost in my face and says, your husband has to look at you. I don't have to look at you. And sure enough, um, I said, but Walter, I'm not even married. And really, this is how we can shoot it. So he calmed down some. But then he got me because I realized that he knew Yiddish. So I said, you know, you can use some Yiddish words. So then the next answer was all in Yiddish, which unfortunately I could never find the tape for. In any event, I remember that Jerry had um, done so, some interviews, but never completed a film on Walter, on uh, Moberg. So when I went to, you know, accepted Bill Levine's wonderful offer, I contacted Jerry. And in fact, he and Neil Goldstein had conducted 30 years ago, dozens of interviews. So these are not ones I did. So when you see William Colby in the film, I and mean, when you saw some of the ba baseball players, although one of them, Eldon Octor, coincidentally, I had actually filmed for, Walt, for my film on Hank Greenberg. In any event, 18 of those interviews are from the fine work that those two filmmakers made. Um, unfortunately, they didn't complete the movie. All the um, interviews are sitting there at, um, uh, the archives in at Princeton, and as you know from the film, Mo went to Princeton. I was able to make an arrangement where I paid for digitizing them. The quality was very good. Jerry was a great DP, and sure enough, we have these wonderful testimonies of the men he spied with and the men he played baseball with. And what I think is a gold mine is with Sam Berg, his brother. So using those interviews interspersed with the, all the interviews I wound up doing, we have what we have now, um, you know, the, the, uh, the catch of uh, behind home plate. So the spy behind home plate. Um, and it's sort of befitting that I uh, made this film and it came out last year. Uh, excuse me, Neil, because I know you're a Mets fan, but in fact, the last time the Nationals, who were called back then the Senators, the reason we're not called the Nationals is we don't have voting rights in Congress. However, today is tax day, and this may be the last year we, don't, we have taxation without representation. If, thing go, if things go right in November, we, you know, a, bill, a bill just pa passed in the House for giving us voting rights. In any event, Memorial Day last year <clears throat> was when the film came out. And I know the Lerner family, and since Mo had been a Senators when they, the team was last in the World Series in 33, they showed an excerpt of the film at Nats Stadium. Um, and from then on, we started winning. So I think it was Mo's karma playing on the field, sort of christening the field, although that's not a Jewish term, but you know what I mean. We went on to win the World Series. So that was really special. The other thing is, um, I hope that you all, let me just explain something, but I hope you all went to the end credits, the end end, and if you saw a group of wonderful looking young men and women, the girl, uh, the females are all my nieces and they are at the end of every one of my films. And then one is my niece's husband, they just had a baby, by the way, baby boy Br uh, Brady, who I hope will grow up to be at least a baseball lover, if not a player. So um, just because I live here in Washington, I just wanna, I always give a little uh, talk about how I cast uh, being in Washington. So when I made Hank Greenberg, it was real obvious because I knew that Senator Sander Levin at the time, excuse me, Senator Carl Levin at the time and his brother Sander Levin, who was a congressman, were great baseball fans. So they were very easy to have in the film. Um, when it came to RB, uh, came to you who Mrs. Goldberg, I was at the French embassy one night and I ran into Justice Ginsburg, which, uh, and those were the days before we called her RBG. 
and may we all have her in our prayers. Uh, hopefully she's doing better in the hospital as we speak. And I came out to her and I said, you know, I'm doing a film on Gertrude Berg and the Goldbergs. And she said, oh, I love the show. Next to Nancy Drew, she was my role model. So of course I went to film her, which is even greater accomplishment for me. I filmed her at the Supreme Court and thanks to the DC bar for flunking me twice, I came here originally to go to law school uh, or I would have been a lawyer. Um, I filmed at the Supreme Court and that night I emailed everyone I knew and said, you know, Aviva Kepner finally made it to the Supreme Court, but she just did it her way. You know, instead of arguing a case, I was filming a, a justice. So when it came to doing Rosenwald, that was easy because the great uh, civil rights leader, John Lewis, had actually gone to a Rosenwald school. So I was able uh, to film him and also Danny Davis wanted to talk about Chicago at the time. So then it came to, uh, what was I gonna do to have a senator in uh, the spy behind home plate? And I know socially, Susan Blumenthal, who is um, the wife of Ed Markey. So luckily I brought it up. Uh, he said, I'd love to do it. It was right after he uh, had introduced uh, the, uh, the, the environmental new deal um, Bill and I had to scurry around to follow him to get, you know, film him. But I think he, you know, at the time we hadn't quite had an ending of the film. And I think he did a great job of saying, you know, uh, Mo's father wanted him to be a Supreme Court justice, which actually was really true. But Mo decided instead to be an American hero. And the reason that line really resonates with me <clears throat> and something that I think really explains Mo is his father never saw him play in high school. All those years at Princeton, when he's throwing around Latin <laughs> signals, and never, never as a player in the <clears throat> major leagues or as a coach. I want to ask you about that, Deviva, for a second. Yeah, I mean, Deviva. psychologically, I, I, ju I just I can't comprehend it because the complete opposite was true about Hank. But the relationship so, between the Jewish experience, the immigrant, early immigrant Jewish experience and the American pastime of baseball, was most father, father's attitude common or an, an anomaly? I mean, how did Jews come to embrace baseball in the beginning? Um, well, I can tell you the reason I love baseball is Heim Poe Kepner, also known as Harold Kepner, my father, used to take my brother and I to games. Um, and he embraced baseball completely when he came to this country. And when he, in the end, um, my parents were later on divorced. Uh, they had met in Berlin and that's where I was born. My dad uh, said he was gonna miss two things moving to Israel when he made Aliyah. And that was his kids in baseball. And I never knew in what order he was gonna miss more. So um, I, think, I think baseball is the most intellectual sport. And as I said, you know, when I said no to doing um, either a football player or um, a boxer to Mr. Levine, I also think it's, you know, the least violent sport. And I just think it's, you know, Americans pastime and it's one way you became American. It's to love the game. I can remember my father sitting there with a little um, transistor radio listening to games. And, you know, that's what I'm doing. I mean, you know, baseball is going to start very soon. Although, uh, as we were talking a little before, I think it's too dangerous for the players. I don't think we should be playing. And I don't consider it a really, the year, this year, a year defending um, our World Series from last year as a Nats fan. I don't think I, my life has ever felt more boring than since I've seen this story of Mo Berg. How is it possible for a human being to have had such an incredible life? It really is beyond imagination, you know, and seems like a work of fiction. What was the spark that empowered him to have such drive and curiosity and such natural ability to immerse himself into the world to the degree that he did? Well, I think one reason he loved playing baseball. Besides, he 
totally love the game and like to, you know, oftentimes when someone says it in the film, that you are a spy being a catcher, although he fell into being a catcher, that um, you sort of have to be the ones spying on the whole field and figuring out what's coming out. But it also gave him the financial ability to travel in the winter. And it kept on going back to Europe. And that's where he really started seeing what was the writing on the wall. I think the two trips to Japan were amazing especially the second one. And uh, I, I'm so grateful to Lefty Gomez. I mean, that amateur footage back then, and that footage, uh, uh, even like Babe on the, on the ship, is, is just priceless. Um, and <laughs> I still can't fathom how Mo, at six foot plus, with looking completely Jewish America or Jew, you know, in a, in a kimono, that wasn't noticeable, especially carrying flowers, you know. Is, is it true that, the hospital. is it true that his kimono is in the Smithsonian, the one that he wore? I don't know. It I'm, might be in the spy okay. museum. You know, there's also a lot of myths about Mo. In several museums, they say that he uh, parachuted in Yugoslavia and fought with Tito. Well, in fact, he was in charge of the Balkans desk for a while in the OSS, but he never did that. There was nothing we could uh, find to prove that. As a matter of fact, there's some footage that was originally labeled at the National Archives that says Mo with Tito. So I got so excited and I sent it to his cousin. Uh, you see Irwin in the film. Well, in fact, it wasn't Mo looking and he was also smoking, which Mo never did. So, you know, there's a mythology yeah, I don't know if any of you saw the feature film last a year, made the year before my film came out on Showtime, and they have him in a shootout. The Mo catch. was never in a shootout. And the catcher so, was a spy with Paul Red. Yeah. As a matter of fact, you know, it, was, it takes a very meticulous, quietly drawn, dangerous mission that he did, work that he did, and it wasn't this sort of like Hollywood shootout at all. I also think John Hamm would have made a better Mo than Rudd is. I think Rudd's a great comedian. And also, if you look at the baseball footage in that show, it was pointed out to me by someone with MLB Films, they have no dirt on their pants, which is not very authentic. How did, um, how did Mo get around the bases with the babe's daughter on the boat? <laughs> what, well, did the babe, what did the babe think about that? Well, what was great was um, when I was talking to the grandson, he said, oh yeah, my, you know, I had read it. Um, and also Gomez's daughter knew about the story. And luckily I was able, actually it was her birthday sometime this week and maybe even tomorrow, but she has since passed away. I was able to do an interview over the phone and she's, you know, she said he flirted, which I think is just, you know, precious. Mm -hmm. um, really makes, uh, and, and the, you know, the kind of footage we were, you know, I believe very much in using um, feature footage as archival footage, because back then we, <laughs> no one spied what you did. So there was either mo um, movies that had footage or else there was training footage. So when William Colby talks about, we learned how to bomb places, you know, we have a footage from from a film, or we have strict OSS footage. So um, I'm very happy to have gotten the footage into, into you know, I have a great editor, Barbara Bello, who's gonna be uh, editing my next two films. Um, and I've always been under the philosophy that documentaries shouldn't be boring and should, and should flow like, um, what do you call it, dramatic movies do, or good dramatic movies. I and mean, one of the things that struck me the most was the section about the recruiting for the OSS and the idea that America's strength is because of our diversity. Well, this that is was that eclectic makeup that gave us the advantage and how relevant that is to what's going on right now. Do you know, you know, we talk about throwing people away. Who do you think we're using for spies in uh, Iran right now. Apparently, we haven't gotten it translated yet, but there's a new series out of Israel called Tehran, just about that, a spy or even with Sasha Cohen, 
playing, you know, being up for an Emmy for playing, you know, the spy in Syria. You have to know these languages. And Mo knew the languages, not only because he was good at languages, it's because what he got from his parents. I mean, unfortunately, my parents each knew five or six languages. That's why my dad was in the military government. And that's why my mother could pass as a Polish Catholic, because she had, uh, uh, she spoke a, like a highfalutin Polish. Um, unfortunately, I, all I know how to do is swear in Yiddish, which I won't bore you with now. I mean, I have kibitz words, but I guess I shouldn't do the, um, I'll save that for later when I'm reading the newspaper and cursing certain people. But seriously, Corva, who was, you know, the head of the OSS and was in charge of Mo in Italy, it was because he had been an immigrant and his father was from Sicily and he knew the typology and he knew, you know, the dialect of a Sicilian Italian. It made all the difference. And I had a meeting, this, a secret meeting this morning. Um, someone is on to something that Mo did that never made it to the film because she didn't have the facts then. But when I um, make the DVD, I always do rich bonus features. Like for, for Rosenwald, we have four and a half hours. I'm on to something that is so big. And again, the reason the person she met was able to work with Mo on something was because he was a child of Hungarian immigrants. So um, these language skills were, were priceless back then. And, can, and, and it was, of course, Mo was very good at languages, but you know, what came first? Hearing so many languages at home and going into it and, you know, just continuing it. And it's something, you know, he had from his parents. And look, you know, on one hand, you could really, and I do criticize his father for not, um, you know, accepting that Mo wanted to be that baseball player and getting the pure joy of going to his son's games. On the other hand, Look how hard he worked. He came before the wife, Mo's mother came. He was literally in a sweatshop. He earned a degree in pharmacy. He ran a pharmacy from morning to night and would disprint, would put out medicine oftentimes before, so people didn't even have to go to doctors. So he's a very, you know, hardworking uh, immigrant who instilled a lot of principles in his kids. And he got one kid, well, sort of a lawyer, <laughs> and another, Sam was a doctor, and his daughter was a school teacher. So it's, it's pretty it's, amazing, you know, in terms of how the kids succeeded in America. It, it seems to me one of the primary ethics he instilled in Mo, especially, was his devotion to America as a patriot. Right. And, you know, that, that degree of commitment he felt to defending his country. I thought it was a bit ironic that he declined the Medal of Freedom. Did you get any insight into why? Yeah, um, Mo did not get along um, uh, with the head of the OSS in Switzerland, which I, the name just went out of my head, um, who later on, Adelis, who later on was involved, you know, with the CIA. Mo should have gone on to the CIA. That's why he was not um, in the CIA. And also he had a dispute about his expense account. Now, excuse me, if you're a spy in Europe and you're going from city to city, are you gonna keep receipts? Because you're gonna be caught in a minute with those receipts. And as it is, you're walking around as a Jewish male so you know how dangerous that is. And once they catch you, even though you have another name and a pseudonym uh, and wearing German shoes, <laughs> you know, design shoes, if they start putting it together, they could look up most name in a minute. Today's world, you could never have, you know, someone as high profile as a baseball, professional baseball player being openly a spy like Mo did right in Europe. It would be different a trip where he would maybe doing something on the side. So um, he was treated unfairly, but I also think he came back a damaged man. I don't know if you ever saw the film Plenty or the play with uh, the movie with Meryl Streep. So she David, isn't back. that David, David Hare play? Yes, she comes back and they made a movie out of it, having been in the resistance and she couldn't adjust to normal life. And I think that was Mo because if he had, if Hank Greenberg was different. He lost four and a half years as a player and Ted did. And 
Joe DiMaggio did and Bob Feller and Yogi. But Han, uh, Mo, I think, w was a coach for five years and would have gone on to, to have been a manager. And that's what he lost. And then something else was lost. And that's why I don't think he could ever, you know, went back home and did anything function in normally afterwards. I mean, how many people have to carry a gun in one pocket and a cyanide pill in the other? Right. That, that interview with Heisberg's son was pretty remarkable. Yeah, no, it's a lovely couple. They're up there in the, you know, it was interesting when I was making the film, we filmed Powers and David off one day in Vermont, went to New Hampshire the next day, and that's where Heisenberg's son was just retiring, and then went to the next state and did Denise Seamus, his cousin. So luckily, New England states are very narrow, so that was quite a four days of shooting, <laughs> and uh, you know a lot of people um, were able to shoot on the way. Yeah, it was very touching when he expressed his gratitude for Mo not assassinating his Right. A little bit of irony, right. High drama, boy. I mean, the 20th century, what can you say? You, you know, it's interesting, Josh, because you're in Nevada and there was, you know, it was in Los Alamos that isn't that far. And I think there was also some the testing, uh, was here. testing in Nevada. What gets me is not only, uh, and I always recommend to people the Manhattan this TV show series called Manhattan, but the fact that Truman did not know the whole time that they kept him from him. And then of course, FDR dies and then Truman has to make, you know, the big decision. Um, so it, it's a very part, you know, it, it was a, a secret that was really well kept. Um, as a matter of fact, there's one story that goes back to Mo, um, you know, the kind of sleuthing he did in Italy because he knew the language and it was clever. You know, he's looking for Farah, who's a very important find for America and rocket science. And what does he think of the mother-in-law? You know, um, Italy is very family oriented. Italians are very family oriented. And that's where he, he finds them. And the, the post story that will be in the bonus feature is they, um, Mo gets him out. And by the way, how did I find the son? Well, I go to my cousin's daughter's wedding and I'm talking to a family member who is, um, you know, knows my films, had been actually supportive of Hank Greenberg. And I'm talking to Art and, he's, and I say, you know, I'm doing this film on Mo Burke. He says, oh, Paul Farrell is a good friend of mine. You got to contact him. Now I might have gotten to him, but you know, it was like a direct case. And luckily he has this um, painting in his house of, uh, these paintings in his house where the family hid during the war and the family home. So we, you know, we shot that and we were able to use that. Um, but so Mo gets Farah out and where do they go? But Casablanca. So uh, Casablanca is my all time favorite movie. I figure they went to Rick's. So he's <laughs> Bowers there with, um, what do you call it? With this OSS operative. And I guess they go for, out to dinner, come home and they got robbed of their papers and their money, but not the box of his experiments that he had the done. The orange box. Right. Well, I mean, so the insight of Bo was that, I mean, a lot of people want to hide from their mother-in-law, but very few people can. Right? right, so sure enough, they, get him to Newark, and of course FDR lets them in, and that really was the basis of the line. I see the spy is uh, catching very well. So how do you see, how do you see this film's trajectory? Uh, where, where, where will it uh, become okay, available? Well, People are going to want to share it. I ever have time, Nick. <laughs> in the next week or two, because I'm working on three other films, which I'll talk about in a minute. I'm hoping to, you know, I think this might be the last of the Jewish film festivals. Um, oh, we got a real formal streaming. Well, it's been a year, you know, a little year plus Memorial Day to get a real formal streaming going on. Um, and then I'll wait and do a DVD with bonus features. 
because like I say, I have a ready sitting on some, but then there's one more story that's unraveling that someone's doing research for. And I made a deal with her this morning that I will film her research and it's gonna be a gold mine, which may even morph into a feature film about what she's discovered about Mo. So, but you know, it, there's a very sad, funny story in the bonus features where like Ira Burkow says, you know, he, he had a past, he had a Mets pass. He could always go to the Mets stadium and watch games. And uh, people like uh, Ira and other uh, sports journalists would say to him, Mo, what did you do during the war? And he kept on going, Shh, I can't talk about it. Well, sure enough, finally, someone sat down to have a meeting with him who either was an agent himself by the bonus feature, I'll have it right, or was a representative from a publisher. So they sit down for lunch and they say to him, well, Mo, how was it to be one of the three stooges? Someone had briefed him incorrectly and thought he was having lunch with one of the three stooges. So Mo was so insulted, he got up and walked out, I will never have an autobiography. So that, I hate to say it, I have to say this in Yiddish, that schmuck, prevented us from really having Mo's inside story. So it was quite a detective story to do this particular film. Did, did you ever hear anything about his feelings related to the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Um, Since he had such a love of Japan? Yeah, yeah. No, it's more about Sam being regretful. Um, did it happen? I think a little bit Mo too. Um, because look, it, it was a, a nuclear arms race. They were terrified, as, I, as we well should have been, if Germany had gotten the bomb. Um, and I, th I, I, it's not specifically what he said, but it was more about Sam, talk, you know, meeting with his brother and realizing that you know what the horrible effects of the bomb was. I don't think that any of them realized it, and I may be pre-guessing a question that'll come up about why didn't the kids get married? Excuse Mary, and I think Sam especially had seen the effects on people having children who had been bombed, and he himself was worried that some of the nuclear, you know, he might have been exposed to some, and that's why he didn't come back and ever have kids. I think with Mo, it was more a story of Estella was his great love, but then she went off and married. You know, we have the interview with her, uh, his uh, her son, um, and I also think he came back a damaged man, where Ethel had had a relationship, it didn't work out, and, and then she just was, I don't think, always um, mentally balanced enough to have a relationship after that. I just, I wanna ask you, well, first I just wanna make a comment about how fascinating it is that his ashes mysteriously disappeared in Israel. Um, what a, or they may still what be here. I enigmatic think, ending, you know. To, I think it's so appropriate that <laughs> in the end, we don't know where Mo was buried. Right. And then the last thing I want to say before we open it up to the questions is, I know you share Mo's obsession with newspapers. Oh yes. Because I've seen you. Oh, I should have. I should have put the pile over here. It's another room. So. That in a lot. You have a strong sentiment about the state of newspapers in America right now. And yeah, well, the last two films have been dedicated to um, the visibility, the viability and visibility of newspapers. You know, it's interesting because there's nothing like sitting down and reading a newspaper. I will use the internet to get a copy of an article, but it's just not the same thing. And it's because I watch my mother my stepfather and my dad reading the paper every day. It's an age thing and I still contend, I argue with my friends that if you only read the newspapers online, you are missing an article and there's two more pet peeves. They'll have, I've even written piece, the one piece I read, wrote for the New York Times was only on online or recently there's an article about my new film, only online or they'll call something online that uh, the, the uh, headline will be different than the print and then we'll try to look it up because if you look it up from the printed, the headline's different online. I don't get this hot 
you know, um, changing the headline from print to what. But, you know, uh, for some people, that's the only way newspapers are going to continue on. So um, what can I say? And I pay an arm and a leg for that habit because it's much more expensive to get the newspaper every day. And there's a lot of people with dogs in my neighborhood who love me because I leave the bags out in front because I get the New York Times and the Washington Post every day. So, so Neil, are you still with us? Yes, I'm still here. Can we uh, open it up to some of our uh, viewing audience? I'm sure you've gotten some, hopefully. Absolutely. I do have a few for, questions. Uh, questions. Yeah. So the first question here is from Arnold. And Arnold would like to know, um, when he asked you to make the film, did you actually know who Mo Berg was? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, you can't make a film about Hank Greenberg and not also know what Mo Berg is. And if you're ever in my house going up the steps, I have three wall hangings made out of yarn. And I have this fabricated Jewish battery where um, Sandy Kopax is pitching to Hank Greenberg being caught by Mo Berg who I think are the three greats. And yes, I tried to ask if Sandy would let me do a film on him. And the answer was no way. All right, I have a, a question from Mark, who says he loved, um, loved the film and learned so much about this intensely impressive man. And it has two questions. If Mo were here with us, what would your first question be for him and why? And you mentioned DC voting rights. Are you a proponent of DC statehood and will it happen? Okay, um, well, unfortunately I'll have to be Mo. It's the meeting I had this morning, we're on to something that Mo did towards the end of the war and we would have loved a verification for him. So I'm gonna be like Mo. I can't talk about the first question I would have, but hopefully um, in about six months you'll see a bonus feature on the DVD. And yes, I'm on the board of DC Vote. And uh, after I get off, I'm gonna email all my fellow board members and past board members and say, hopefully this is the, the last day we'll have the slogan on our, uh, we'll all have to get new uh, tags on our car. My tag right now says DC Vote, but it also says taxation without representation. You know, I'm an, Im I'm an immigrant. I'm a child of immigrants. When I grew up, my father used to take me in the voting booth. I think it is the biggest right we have as, as citizens. And it's absolutely a shanda, a scandal that DC doesn't have a vote. And a lot of it is because for many years, population wise, it's Chocolate City. And actually it still is a very large uh, African-American populated city. And, uh, it, it skews democratic. So, but even when we had democratic majorities, people just didn't fight for us. But we've been activists for years. And, you know, this bill, HR 51, I have a flag outside my uh, house flying, not flying, it's tagged to the, um, uh, what do you call it, to the house, but upside down and with 51 stars. And as soon as we get it, I'm going to make sure to put it the right side. So, All right. Uh, I have another question. That's the answer to your question. And I always um, wanted to get an Academy Award for one of my films so I could just go up and hold it like this and say, and this is for voting rights for the citizens of Washington. But with that bill that just passed, I finally realized um, it'll happen in my lifetime. Okay. Of course, uh, certain things have to go right in November. Sandra would like to know the story behind the interesting picture behind you. Oh, the painting? Yes. Oh, thank you for asking. So the name of the foundation is Cheshla, which is my mother's maiden name. Um, and unfortunately named after my grandparents and aunt, but all perished in Auschwitz. So um, after the war, my mother, uh, uh, and after my parents' divorce, went and got an art degree. So that's actually my mother's self-portrait. So if you go on HelenKavinsky.org, we're selling hundreds of her paintings. She was an abstract expressionist painter, uh, very uh, influenced by the abstract expressionists. 
She had a one woman show at the Detroit Institute of Art. So I'm very proud to be the daughter of an artist. Thank and you. that's something um, we share in common. Right. I'm not the daughter of an artist, but I am the son of an artist. Of an artist. Yes, does great art. Right. Matter of fact, here's a original Rita Dean and Abby. Right. Nice. And uh, Aviva got to meet my mother when she was out here. No, that was great. And Aviva, Arnold has Aviva's another... mother's work is exceptional. Yeah. And uh, one of my nieces is also painting. So I, I have that in another location. And it's a backdrop in one of my new movies. And, and tell us about the basement. What goes on in the basement in your house? Oh, it's my 501c3, but no one's been here for three months. So in fact, you know, every, a lot of people live in my neighborhood. Um, so we do a lot of, I do Zooming. My one regret is I didn't buy stock in Zoom. Uh, I've become a, a Zoom arena. It's sort of like a ballerina, you know. I'm on my toes with the Zoom all the time. Although I have to say, unless it's sent to me in a certain way, I totally freak out. I had a reunion of my college newspaper. We call ourselves the Old Geezers last night. And I couldn't get in because she made you start from zero. I was actually in tears, but luckily I emailed a friend who got me on. And, you know, this is a great way to communicate. It's didn't nothing you, like me. Didn't you do production in the, in the basement on your earlier projects as well? No, it's my living room. I mean, there's other paintings you'll notice that, you know, are backdrops. No, oh, I actually, you're right. The editing room is downstairs. So that, that's what I'm referring to. That's the most dormant room not right now. Because I won't let anyone in, you know, I'm being very strict because I want to be able to see my family and especially my niece who just had a baby boy. Anyone else, Neil? Yeah, I got a few more questions here. Um, has the government declassified any information uh, for what Mo has done? Yeah, you know, it, through the years, more and more is being uh, declassified. So, like, I had an advantage over Neil and um, Jerry when they made the film 30 years ago. So, in fact, I was able to uh, get more and more material. And there's certain um, archivists that specialize, Susan Strange, the, the, the one most prominently, who specialize in doing um, research in OSS, and we were able to find more and more documents. And uh, Charles was very helpful, the head of the OSS Society, so it's just great. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Was his friction with Alan Dulles? or John Foster Dulles? I knew you were gonna ask that. It's Alan. I'm almost sure. Because he then became the head of the OS, the CIA. Where Foster was uh, a diplomat. Uh, interesting brothers. How good was Mo before his injury? injury? Was he all-star oh. quality? Oh yeah, no, definitely. Now it's interesting because when it came to going to Japan, the second trip, uh, when that other catcher, whose name I don't remember right now, got injured, Mo was not as the caliber of the other players, but the fact that um, he knew or could know Japanese by the time they arrived and had made the other trip made him, you know, invaluable for going to Japan. Was, was that rooftop footage, the actual footage he took? Or? That's, that's Gomez's footage, okay. Lefty Gomez and the family were great about letting me have the footage for um, the film for like a dollar. I mean, they were so excited. You know, that's just when those cameras came out and that's what he took up on the roof and some of the footage he had, but you know, you, you can't, you, you just can't replace that home movies like that. Let's um, take, uh, let's take uh, just two more, Neil. Okay. Well, I have two questions from two questions from Joanne. They're very simple. Is Mo's essay on baseball available? And maybe right. quickly, you could just uh, she wants to know what um, uh, um, your mother's name is again. Okay, Helen, and then it's c o v e n s k y dot org. And there's like uh, my mother's story there. You can see footage of her. We d we shot some uh, footage at an opening. And also all the paintings available for sale. 
So thank you so much for asking. She signs her paintings, Helen Cheshla Kavinsky, but um, the website is Helen Kavinsky with a C. Great, and her other question was, is Mo's essay on baseball available? Yes, yeah, just go online and you can find it. Very good, I have one mm -hmm. more question. Yes. Um, and first they wanted to thank you for the documentary and for speaking with us. And they enjoyed the documentary very much. Um, and they saw the Hollywood movie starring Paul Rudd and they hinted that there was a possibility that Mo may have been bisexual, is that true? And why do you think that none of the other siblings were married? Well, I think I answered why none of the other siblings were married, that Sam was frightened that he might have a deformed kid having been exposed to radioactivity. Mo came back a damaged man in his great love with Estella and she already had married someone else. And I don't think emotionally uh, Ethel could establish a relationship. Uh, I'm sorry, what was the other question with that? Um, if he was bisexual. Or... Yeah, okay. So there is one line in Davidoff's book where one player suggests it. And I was furious because apparently the screenwriter ran with that theory, that theory. There's nothing else to explain it. If uh, to, to justify it, because if you look at the footage of 30 years ago with the players and they talked about what a ladies man he was and that wonderful relationship with Estella where his, her, her son gave us great photographs, it's a bubble mycin. And you know, there's this whole um, theory about or, or situation when Hollywood makes biopics and how much they really stick to the story. Uh, in my Rosenwald film, there's a wonderful author named Alila Bundles, who is the great granddaughter of Al um, Madame Walker, who started, was the first uh, African-American female millionaire. She developed products for hair. And um, she wrote a, bi a, a biography of her great grandmother. And then Netflix did a two part series and Alila was so upset with the sort of exaggerations and you know, just making up certain rivalries, et cetera. She wrote a very long essay uh, that you can get online by Alila Bundles about you know, how they took such liberties that they distorted what her great grandmother did. And she and I are gonna probably talk together. I've kept pretty quiet about the Mo thing, but it really does make me mad because there are several people in my film who for years, you know, Kaplan and Fox and uh, my namesake of Eva Miller were trying to make a, a real feature film on Mo and finally Hollywood did it and they got it wrong, which is a segue into one of my new films. Can I talk about what I'm working on now? Please do. Okay, so as we speak, you can go to the website, Imagining the Indian. For four years, I've been working with others on a film about the insidious use of Native American mascotting in sports. And of course, the, the worst example was the Washington football team. But thanks to the Black Lives Matter and the climate here and corporate moral responsibility for saying to Dan Schneider, you can't be using this racial slur anymore for a name. This week has been hell on wheels. And you know we're shooting something that's happening in real time. And in fact, they're gonna to have to change the name. Um, and we're hoping to get the film out by the end of the year because we also have to worry about what's happening in Atlanta with the Braves and the Tomachop, Chop, Cleveland Indians, um, the hockey team, uh, the Chicago Blackhawks, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs and the Warriors, the Golden State Warriors. But really, if you look around so many high schools and colleges have names and mascots that are disrespectful to our indigenous population. And the worst example is Hollywood, you know, how they kept on perpetuating all these stereotypes. So um, we have a three minute trailer on imagining the Indians, please go there. And if you need tax deductions this year and so moved, I'm, I've been doing it all day and I'm gonna go back to it. We're furiously trying to fundraise for that film. And I'm proud to be working <clears throat> with three others. My co-director is a Native American, Ben West. She, he's Cheyenne. We've actually written a script together because when I was, before I came here to go to law school, and I always thank the DC bar for flunking me, 
or there wouldn't have been all these marvelous films on Jewish heroes. Um, I did do Native American law and activism, so I'm glad to be back on this subject. And it was brought to me by Kevin Blackstone and St. Bardley. And Kevin is uh, an ESP commentator and writes for the Washington Post. And we say it's not a coincidence that the four of us are making this film, you know, Jewish, Black, and Native American, whose own people have suffered from slavery and genocide. You know, um, and then the other film I'm doing is I'm going back to doing a little feminist film. Um, you know, when they built the Congress, they didn't think women would be either in the House or the Senate. So they never built the basic thing of bathrooms right off either one. So women, once they did get into both bodies of the legislature, had to, you know, run to go to the bathroom much far away. It's like in the scene in Hidden Figures. So it's really a film about architecture, uh, uh, you know, exclusive, ex wait, what do we, there's a term that they say in architecture where, you know, it's just not fair, but it's really a film about potty parody <clears throat> and it's called Pissed Off. And the older I get, the more I have to go to the bathroom, the more, oh yeah, I know it's exclusionary architecture. The more determined I am to make that film. There's also a website pissed off, but good old William Levine had a new idea for me. <clears throat> so I'm also making a film on Ben Hecht, who was a great newspaper man in Chicago, but one of the great Hollywood screenwriters from Notorious to Wuthering Heights. He even uh, worked on Gone with the Wind <clears throat> and was the uh, ghost writer for Marilyn Monroe. Um, but more importantly, he worked with the Berkson Group uh, trying to do everything he could by writing pageants and writing headlines and ads to try to get European jury into this country. So, um, you know, something that I know in today's world we would all be compelled to do, but there wasn't enough done in there. Talk about hiding the lead. When it came out that two million had died, the New York Times like buried the story as did the Washington Post. I mean, the times are very different now, but it's really something that we have to be very cognizant of in terms of, you know, getting the news out when there, um, you know, when there are genocides happening. And Ben Hecht was one of the real heroes in that. So Aviva, in closing, because you've dedicated such enormous passion and energy to archiving the Jewish experience and have accomplished such remarkable uh, cinematic feats. In general, where do you see the future of Jewish content cinema evolving? Will it be the historical documentation? Will it be, how will the Holocaust films focus on the Holocaust evolve? Do you have any concept about? I started over 30 years ago, the Jewish Film Festival here. I'm amazed how generation after generation keeps on making these films. So I don't see them going anywhere. The only problem is the, the venue of showing them. So we're in a streaming situation instead of me being in person. So um, that's in question right now. So most of all, I say to all of you, make sure you wear a mask, you stay safe, um, and make sure you know your family and friends do because we got we we got to find a cure for this horrible disease. But we also have to be smart in protecting ourselves, our family, and friends. But you agree that there's enormous value in the art of film's role in Jewish continuity. Absolutely. And I. Wow. I encourage everyone else, everyone viewing and, and all your friends and your contacts to encourage them to be safe as well at this time. Because that and is- And also all my films, we're, we're just getting money from the Claims Commission to digitize and do a new Partisans of Illinois DVD. But you can buy uh, Hank Greenberg online. You can, with all these bonus features, you can buy You Who Mrs. Goldberg online and Rosenwald. They're all available on the Cheshla Foundation website. 
Moberg, you gotta wait some. And the other films will come out as soon as I can raise the money, which is I gotta go back and do now. Well, on behalf of everybody participating, uh, we're just extremely grateful for the work you do, Aviva, and for joining us today. Uh, I think we're gonna close it out, Neil, and we're gonna show a preview of our next film online for the Virtual Jewish Film Festival, which is gonna be in August. And yep. uh, thank you, Aviva. My pleasure. Yes, thank you so much, Joshua. Thank you so much, Aviva. That was fascinating to listen to. You were wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, our next film um, in our virtual series is called Kishan. His name precedes him. It's an Israeli documentary that will be shown in subtitles. Our guest panelist will be film creator Eric Bernstein. The tentative date for the webinar will be a Sunday. So please make a note of that because our um, panelists will be in Israel and there's a huge time difference. So it would be tentatively scheduled for Sunday, August 16th at 12 noon. Just stay tuned to your emails and our Facebook page um, for updates about when the film will be available to be seen, as well as when the uh, webinar will be. And if you would like, we are gonna show a trailer to the film right now. כל בוקר באותה שעה הייתי עובר את הגשר מעל הדנובה, ומולי, מהצד השני של הגשר, הייתה עוברת נערה בת כלי, עם עיניים כחולות ורגליים יפות. עם הזמן התחלנו לחייך אחד לשני. אם היינו בזמנים נורמליים, אולי החיוכים היו הופכים לפגישה על הספסל בגן הציבורי, אבל בינתיים הגרמנים כבשו את הונגריה, והדבר הראשון שהם עשו, זה לסמן את היהודים במגן דוד צהוב שמונה סנטימטר. היה צריך לתפור את זה על כל בגד מקדימה ומאחורה, ככה שאי אפשר לפספס. אז למחרת בבוקר הלכתי על הגשר, והנערה באה מולי. אני הייחתי אליה, והיא חייכה, ואז החיוך שלה קפא והפך לסלידה עמוקה. לא אשכח זאת לעולם. היא ראתה את הכוכב הצהוב, ואני... אני הפכתי בבת אחת מנער לפשפש עלוב. אתה רוצה לעשות הפסקה? לא, נמשיך. אין לי ספק, אין לי ספק שבית um, הספר של השואה, <laughs> מלחמת העולם השנייה, עיצבה חלקים גדולים באישיות שלו. אין ספק. הסרקזם, החשדנות, התחושה שאנחנו לא עומדים על קרקע יציבה, אבל בחיים שלנו הוא, הוא חזר לשם כל יום. היו לו את כל הקסטות של היטלר, עוד נבחר מנהיגים, והוא ידע את הנאומים, קלטות, הוא הקליט, והיינו נוסעים באוטו במרחבי תל אביב, אבא עם שני הילדים הקטנים, גם רפי שהצטרף, ו... שומעים בטייפ ב- ברחובות תל אביב את הנאום של היטלר. אני לא חושבת שאנשים יכולים להבין מה הלך פה. ההתמודדות שלו עם מה שקרה הייתה, אני לא אגיד, יכול להיות שאפילו אובססיבית. הוא היה אוכל, היה מסדר לו את הדברים. והיה אוכל, והיה קורא, אנחנו אכלנו לידו, ואם היית לוקח משהו בטריטוריה שלו, הוא היה מכה על היד. עכשיו, זה לא בדיוק התגובה של האבא המצוי. ולפני שהיה הלך לישון, הוא היה רוקע, כמו שהקצינים הנאצים היו רוקעים, והוא היה אומר, היי. כאילו, מחווה 
מאוד קישוני, אבל מאוד בדלתיים סגורות, וזה כן היה מביך אותי. אם מישהו מבחוץ היה רואה את זה, ואני גם בעצמי כשאני אומרת את זה, אני חושבת שיש אנשים שלא היו מבינים את זה. It's a very, very fascinating documentary. I saw it in the Toronto Jewish Film Festival two years ago. Um, Kishon was a very important Israeli filmmaker and internationally renowned figure. So I encourage everybody to uh, participate. Okay, I think we're ready to sign off. Shalom. Thank you, Shalom. Thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy.